No, all right, let's lock in. Let's lock in. Let's lock in. Come back. Come back. Come back. Laptops down. Phones away. Laptops down. Phones away. All right. So, um, Amanda really doesn't need many introductions, but uh, I'll give it to him. Todd is a um, a good friend. Um, I met Todd years ago uh, playing basketball. I'll let him talk about the story. But Todd is a mental performance coach. His mission today is to help you guys. Just reserve the plug yourself when you're done. Yep. Understand the three pillars of elite results. So one thing that I did was I made this book mandatory for our class. Why is because at the end of the semester, when you guys are doing your final exam, a lot of the core tenets that you guys will hear tonight and that you've read are applicable to business, life, and sales. Okay, so Todd is a, a mental performance coach. He's also been in sales. He's been an executive in sales. Uh, he's done it all. Hall of Fame basketball player. He'll, he'll run you through it. Um, not a better salesperson, not a better uh, person in general to have in class tonight. An absolute legend uh, in sales. So I'm going to let you take it away and uh, class is yours. I want to focus. Relax. So you can stop clapping. Thank you for playing along. Stay standing, please. Enthusiasm is contagious. The question is whether or not you know just worth catching or avoiding it. Thank you guys for playing along. All right, let's get started. All right, so if you want to sit down, you want to sit down quick, man. Let's go. Here's what I want you guys to do it's never too old, I believe, for a power clap. How many people are in athletics here? A couple people have done this before. On the count of three, I want some energy. It's a choice. On a count of three, I want everyone to give me one loud power clap. One, two, three. On a count of three, we're going for two. One, two, three. Let's go for three. One, two, three. Here's what we're going to do next. We're going to put our right hand out, our left hand back, and we're going to go, oh, one, two, three. Right. That's really good. You want the next move, yes or no? This side of the room. Yeah. You want the next move, yes or no? Yeah. Yes. This side of the room, yes or no? Yes. This is what we're going to do. We're going to put our right hand back and our left hand, or right hand forward, left hand back. We're going to go from here, spirit fingers. And then what we're going to do, just watch right now. We're going to clap and we're going to go like this, be elite. And here's why. 
Here's why. Tonight, our time together is about the three pillars of elite results. It's about going from temporary results to legendary. I know Zev brings people in every couple of weeks. I don't want to be just another keynote speaker that comes in, throws up information for the next 90 minutes, and then in a day, a week, a month from now, you guys forget about me and everything we talk about. Uh-uh. Not in my watch. I want this to be a transformational experience right here in the Jenison Hall, whatever the hell this place is called, <laughs> that sets you on fire long term so that you become the best version of yourself personally and ultimately professionally. Okay? So we're going to go from here, spirit fingers, oh, to be elite on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, elite. Terrible. Oh, be elite. One, two, three. Oh, Good. I want you to high five the person next to you and have a seat. <laughs> All right. I want you to get used to something for the next hour or so. You are going to get out of our company. So if you get that into your mind, you're going to have more fun. If you don't, it's going to be a struggle. Now, before I kick it off, I just want to say, obviously, a quick thank you to Professor Young. We've had a long history of battles on the basketball court to where we were, weren't really too good of friends, um, where we finally respected each other, which is what competition is all about. And ultimately, uh, he's the only guy that I've spoken to in that league for the past 10 years. We've become very good friends. So I appreciate you having me here. So uh, on a count of three, I want everyone to say with energy, thanks, Professor Young. One, two, three. Thanks, yeah, thanks Professor Young. Let's rewind the clock for a minute. Let's think about summer, not this past summer, the previous summer of 2022. How many people, show of hands, thought the Summer Olympics in Tokyo a year, about a year and a half ago? Anyone like the Olympics? You guys like the Olympics? A couple people? I don't know about you, but I, I had aspirations growing up. Obviously, I'm older now, 44 years old. Uh, I had aspirations of being an Olympian. I did. I don't know why. I always wanted to be an Olympian. And what's crazy, guys, is that last year, I thought that was the year. I thought that was the year I was finally going to become an Olympian. I was ranked sixth in the country. And the top five went to Tokyo. What was I ranked? Six. What was I ranked? Six. Six. So I'm good, but I'm not good enough. But I'm driving over here today. I'm thinking to myself, and I drove from New York. I'm like, you know what would be really cool? If we played the sport that I'm ranked sixth in the country with everyone here today. So we're going to be there right now. Now, here's the deal. You have one rule. And the rule is this. If you get knocked out, all you have to do is keep playing. If everyone understands that rule, say aye. 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 So the sport that I'm ranked sixth in the country is called Simon Says. How many people have played Simon Says? Who doesn't know Simon Says? Okay, here's the game. Just two people? Three people. So the game is this. If I say Simon Says, put your finger on your nose, you're going to put your finger on your nose. So let's role play. Simon Says, put your finger on your nose. Okay. And if I say Simon Says, put your finger on your head, you do that. And then if I say, put your finger on your nose, go ahead. But Simon didn't say that, so you shouldn't have done it. You got it? Okay. So if Simon said it would do something, you do it. If I don't, and I get you, you don't do it. Everyone know how to play? All right. So I've done this before. And what happens usually is people's morals drop and their competitiveness goes up. In other words, they cheat. So in order to not cheat, here's where we're going to get started. I want everyone to stand up with your arms crossed so that I can see when I knock everyone out. All right, you got to be quick, you got to think on your feet, and you got to be with, okay? All right, you guys Wait, ready? Do you get out when you get out or no? No, so that's the one rule. If you get out, you just keep playing, okay? So I'm going to start with your arms crossed so I can see when I knock you out. I guarantee I'm going to knock you guys out at least three to four times, okay? Now, I said let's get started, and Simon didn't say stand up or cross your arms, so everyone got knocked out twice as far as I can see, all right? All right, let's sit down. We're really going to play now. Simon says sit down. Yeah. Are you guys ready to play? Say yes. Simon says, are you guys ready to play? Say yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. We're really going to play. I'm not kidding right now. I want you to be quick. I want you to think on your feet. Don't wait for me to say it. You hear it, you do it, okay? All right, here we go. Simon says stand up. Got to be quick. Got to be quick. Come on. Simon says sit back down. Good. Stand back up. 
Good. Simon says, stand back up. Simon says, give me one loud power clap. Give me two. Keep playing. Keep playing. Simon says, if you're the ladies in the room, raise your hand. Simon says, ladies, let's show the guys how to dance. All right. Simon didn't say stop. All right, Simon says stop dancing. We're almost done. Simon says put your left hand in the air. Everyone should have your left hand in the air because Simon said so. I don't know why you're waving at me, but how you doing? But Simon says put your left hand in the air. Simon says make a circle with your left hand. Everyone should be doing that. And Simon says put your left hand on your chin. Good. Pause. This is your cheek. This is your chin. <laughs> Simon says game over. Have a seat. Can I get everyone except for you on that last one? Everyone put it here, but it's supposed to be on your chin. Did everyone catch that? So what did we learn from the silly game of Simon saying? People don't follow what you say. They follow what you do. Let's say that again. People don't follow what you say. They follow what you what? Do. do. And so what that tells us is leadership. And by the way, every single person in here is a leader. Because with every bit of human interaction that you have with somebody else, a peer, a classmate, your family member, girlfriend, boyfriend, doesn't matter. You get a chance to lead that person. And so, again, what that tells us is leadership is not a some of the time thing. Leadership is an all of the time thing. You can't just turn it on and off like a light switch. Okay. And the exceptional leaders, they understand how to lead themselves on their very worst day. It's easy to lead yourself on a good day. Let's make believe it's Friday, okay? Done with class, almost done with classes. Gonna hang out, a couple parties, whatever we do here at Bentley University, have a few drinks. We got the weekend ahead. Ladies, we go to the spa. Jack, gentlemen, we're going to see a football game or we're gonna watch football on TV. It's easy to come to class on a Friday morning and do your homework, return emails, return text messages, smile at people on campus. It's easy. But how about here in the Northeast on a Monday morning? When it's cold and it's snowing, and you got a full week of class, tests, homework, and a lot of stuff you need to do. That is when exceptional leaders understand how to lead themselves and other people. And we're going to talk about that tonight. But first, anytime that I speak, I've got rules of engagement. And there's always three of them. Okay? The first rule of engagement is a callback. What is a callback? A callback is a check for understanding. Okay, if at any point in time, we've done this twice today, I said to you guys, uh, uh, what was I ranked? You guys said what? I said, people don't follow what you do. They follow what you what? I'm sorry, people don't follow what you say. They follow what you do. Those are callbacks. If I ask for a callback today, it's because I'm telling you something extremely important that's going to help you personally and professionally. So I just ask that you get out of your comfort zone and play along. The other thing is this. Repetition is the mother of all learning. So in sales, which everyone in here probably wants to go on some sort of sales or is doing it already, if you want to leave a customer and feel confident about the message that you delivered, ask for a callback. I was in pharmaceutical sales, just like Professor Young, medical device. Every time I left a customer, I said, hey, doc, let me just reiterate what we just talked about. And I ended with his call to action. That's a callback. I want him to tell me or her to tell me what we just talked about. Really important strategy in sales. Secondly, check in all in. At any point in time tonight, if I stop what I'm saying and I point at you and I say, check in, I want you guys to point back at me and say, all in. On a count of three, we'll role play. One, two, three. Check in. All, all in. in. Good. The reason why we do that is this. You're either all in or you're in the way. Period. There's no such thing as half pregnant, all right? You either are, you are. And to me, to me, more today more than ever, presence is a lost art. It is so hard to be present with all the distractions, all the technology, everything going on out there. It is so hard to stay present. And so what I'm gonna ask of you, and I heard Professor Young already asked this, is for the next hour or so, I want you to be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. Great football coach, speaking of um, Ivy League schools, of Yale University, 
coach Tony Reno talks about flipping the mental switch. And he says, when my players are in pads, when my players are on the field and practicing the game, they are what we call Superman. They're going to be the best Yale football players that they can be. But when they're in a classroom and they're studying, they're Clark Kent. And they're going to be the best Yale students they can be. That's called flipping the mental switch. And that's being where your feet are. It's really important to understand this. No matter what happened before I walked in this room, what kind of day you had, what kind of morning you had, it doesn't matter. It's gone. It's over. We can't get it back. And whatever you have to do tonight at 9 o'clock, whatever you have to do in the morning, we're not there yet. All that matters is what we're doing right here, right now, learning and growing together. That's how you maximize your day, and that's how you maximize your life. So I'm going to ask of you to be where your feet are. The last thing is, and we've already done this, I appreciate this, is bringing the juice. That means just bringing the energy. I got news for you. Everybody in this room has the same amount of energy. Everybody. Physiolog physiologically, everybody has the same energy. The question is, you guys probably know each other a little bit, or you know people where some people have energy levels here, and some are here, and some are here, and some are here. And the people that are down here always say, how do you always have so much energy? Where do you get all your energy? Where they get it is they understand how to unblock it. And I'm going to talk about how to unblock it. There's two types of people in this world. For anyone who's note takers in here, lifters and leaners. Let me explain. A lifter, when you engage with a lifter, you leave them better off than they were before you spoke to them. You feel so much better speaking to someone because they gave you a lending ear, something they said, they gave you a hug, they gave you attention, eye contact, a spoken word. They made you feel better because of them. A leaner, negative, gossip, low energy, lethargic. Don't be a leaner, be a lifter. Let's talk about some lifters right now. Before I get to the three individuals on this page, I often get the question, what is mental performance? People always say to me, you know, Todd, you talk about mental performance and mental performance mastery, and you're a mental performance coach. What, what is that? Well, when people ask me that question, I usually throw two questions back at them. And the first question I ask is, what is your name? Dom. Did you wake up today to be mediocre? Yes or no? No. no. Dom didn't wake up today to be average. And so 100% of the time that I've asked that question, I've gotten that answer. No. That allows me to ask the second question, which is, and this is rhetorical, if you didn't wake up today, today to be mediocre or average, then what are you doing to train your mindset, which is your greatest skill set, to handle all of life's adversities, all of life's obstacles and hurdles? From a strategy standpoint, what are you doing? And 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is nothing. And so back to the question, what is mental performance? <laughs> mental performance is having an unbreakable system with a bulletproof mindset so that when you do get hit with life's adversities, you don't just kind of get through it. You don't lose days being upset. You thrive through it because you got the strategies to do so. You want to talk about thriving through? Let's talk about Aaron Ralston. Raise your hand if you heard the story of Aaron Ralston. Watch this video. On April 26, 2003, Aaron Ralston was hiking in the mountains of Utah. He's a Colorado native. And upon his solo descent down the side of a canyon, he dislodged an 800-pound boulder, pinning his right arm to the side of the canyon. He had, after five days, five days, he ran out of resources. He had no more food, nothing. And he thought to himself at this point, hmm, I've got one chance of survival and it's going to take two steps. And so the first thing he did with his arm pinned to the side of the canyon is he violently torqued his body and he created a compound fraction to, to fracture to his right arm. Compound fractures where it pierces the skin, you can expose the bone. The second thing was unthinkable. He took a dull pocket knife and he amputated his right arm. It took him two hours. Do you understand 
the level of courage and mindset it takes to do this. And then he hiked seven more miles. That's how far up he was on the side of the canyon, where he ran into a local family that got him the rescue. Let's pause on Aaron Ralston for one second. In a totally unrelated story, 10 years later, January 9th, 2012, it's another Aaron coincidentally. Her name was Aaron Langworthy. Aaron Langworthy was bungee jumping in a jungle of Zimbabwe. With 65 feet left to her fall, the bungee cord snaps, propels her into crocodile infested water. With two broken collarbones, ruptured spleen, internal bleeding in her head, she swims 25 meters to shore. Here's the coincidence and commonality between Aaron Ralston and Aaron Langworthy. Totally unrelated, they don't know each other. But when asked about their life altering events, they answered the question the exact same way. They shrugged their shoulders, they smiled, and they said, You know what? Could have been worse. Aaron Ralston and Aaron Langworthy, they understand that it's not what happens to you in life, it's how you handle it. We talk a lot about sales in this room, and I'm going to give some sales example, examples. But there have been other speakers. And I know what a great job Professor Young does on getting you guys ready to be great sales leaders and sales reps and whatever else you want to do. Tonight, I'm going to talk about life. Because if you can't get yourself right personally, it doesn't matter what you do professionally. The last person is a good friend of mine. His name is Jason Fowler. To this day, I have never told the story of Jason Fowler. I don't think I can do it justice. It's a story of great tragedy, but also great perseverance and great resilience. So I bring Jason Fowler in and tell his own story. You're on, brother. What happened? Ready? Go. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Jason Fowler. I grew up racing motorcycles um, at age of six. Um, at the age of 17, I had a, an accident. I didn't see a rock in some grass. And um, I hit the rock, sent me flying off my bike, and um, paralyzed me from the chest down. At that moment, you can imagine, right? I'm a 17-year-old, the prime of my life, amazing things happening, just won eight straight New England championships in nine years and um and i'm faced with a choice i either lay down feel sorry for myself and and um and wallow in my sorrow or i kind of get up and move on and um i was really i was raised by parents like this this story kind of tells the tells the, the sense of that you'll get from it um uh two days after I'm in the hospital. My mom comes to me. She goes, all right, we're going to give you about two weeks to feel bad for yourself. Then we're getting out of here. We're moving on. And we're going to do the best with what you have. And that was the tone that was set from that day forward. And um, while I was in the hospital, I saw the Boston Marathon. I was like, wow, you got to kidding me. Like, you can do a marathon, like 26 miles in a wheelchair? Like, how cool is that, right? And so I made that my goal. Fast forward a year and a half, I qualify for the Boston Marathon. Or I should say, fast forward five months, I'm out of the hospital and I borrow a racing wheelchair from a friend of a friend. Um, fast forward a year and a half, I qualify for the Boston Marathon. Fast forward two years, I'm in the Boston Marathon, the youngest competitor um, in the wheelchair division ever. And, um, and I finished my first marathon. I'm like, wow, this is cool. So I got the bug. Fast forward from that, third, or, uh, 10 years later, and I finished. 30 marathons and, and I really started getting bored with it. I got bored of the distance. They weren't really hard. They weren't challenging. I saw the Ironman on television. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Um, for, you, for those of you that don't know what the Ironman is, it's 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and, and it's 26.2 mile marathon all in one day, all at once. I said, oh, I want to do that. And not only do I want to do an Ironman, I want to do the world championships, where, which are held in Hawaii. So I made that my goal. And my first, um, I go to the trials. So fast forward 
three years. I, at this point, I, I don't have a bike. I've never swam before. I mean, I've swam in pools, right? But like, that's not swimming Ironman. Um, I get to my first, to the trials and I qualify and I get to go to the world championships. Well, ease up there, big guy. I get there, I finish the swim. I get 108 miles into the 112 mile bike and I get pulled off the course because I didn't make the time cutoff. <clears throat> I was about six miles from the finish and about 15 minutes away. I'm going, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, all right, I gotta work harder, right? I gotta work harder. How do I do this? Like, I'm very goal oriented at this point, right? I mean, I put goals in front of myself, I work hard. And, and, um, and I work harder. And I go the next year and I fail and I don't qualify. I go the next year and I go to two places. I go to Europe and the US. And meanwhile, to qualify for the hand cycle division, you're one of five in the world that gets qualified. So it's a really small group. And I, and I fail again. I'm like, what do I got to do? And I'm getting, at this point, I'm getting beat by just a few minutes. I go the third time, I get beat again by less than two minutes. And I failed again. And that same year, I went again to the European qualifier. And again, I'm spending thousands of dollars. I'm, I'm working full time. Um, and um, people tell me, like, you're crazy. Why are, why are you torturing yourself with this goal? Like, they're just faster. They're better. Their injury levels are different. You know, they have more um, potential than you. And I'm like, I'm doing this. And, um, and, I, and I, you know, that year I didn't. And so finally, seven years after I, I, um, I made it my goal, I get to the world championships. I get to the trials. I win the trials. I go to the race. And not only do I want to finish, I'm like, I want to finish, but I want to win this race. I got second place and then I crossed the finish line. I was like, wow, this is amazing, right? Like, okay, second place. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't, but what I found through that process is the bigger the goal, the bigger the effort. And for me that, I just kept stacking that one on the other. And so fast forward a year from that, after getting second place and I go back and I race and I have a, the battle of a lifetime with one of my heroes growing up, and, um, and I win, and I win the world championships. I'm like, wow, like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Like, it, 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 it really is that, I won't say that simple, but the thing that I learned was every day, I put in front of me only what I can control. I focus on only what I can control. There's so much noise in our world. There's so much, there's people that are going to say no. There's a, people, you can't do this. There's going to be people that doubt you. There's going to be people that don't care. For me, it was like, focus on what I control. The second was having a plan. Of course, after failing once, twice, three, four, however many times, um, I learned a lot and I made adjustments and I made a detailed plan for what that looked like. And, um, and last, I never gave up. Like I could have given up after the first, second, third, fourth. And we're talking years of what I would call like falling on my face, um, which we know is, is really disguised as like, as gifts of learning. Right. Um, but, but that, those lessons that I got where, um, the bigger the goal, the bigger the effort, um, it just requires it. And, and I learned so much from that. So I hope my story helps you guys. Um, here to hang out with you guys for a few minutes, but, um, yeah. Appreciate it. So, Jason, what's cool for you guys is he lives in East Boston, right? South Boston. Um, I speak all over the world. I've got uh, lucky, lucky enough to speak over in Europe as well. So, I can't bring Jason everywhere I go. So, what he usually does is he gives me this video. Okay, so we're going to skip by the video and we're going to talk about what he just mentioned. There are some things I might, I might say that he didn't say right now that was in the video, but you get the gist. So the first thing is, Jason just said, control what you can control. Now, people say to me all the time, they're like, Todd, especially my clients, they say, Todd, you always say control you can control. It's easier said than done, especially when you're facing the adversity. And I say back to them, well, is it though? Let's think about it for a minute. If you can't control something, if there's nothing you can do, 
Why are you worried one second? Why are you spending a minute thinking about that? You can't control it. There's nothing you can do. And if you can control it, then what's the problem? You can control it. There is an action you can take. There is a step forward you can take to get yourself out of the adversity. So the first thing I do with every client is I put up a white sheet of paper. I draw a line down the middle. I say things you can control, things you can't. You know what I usually see? A laundry list of things they can't and two or three things they can. That's the problem. So rule number one is become self-aware of what you can and can't and write down what you can and go get those. Raise your hand if you remember Professor Young doing this exercise. Professor Young did it wrong. That's okay. I want a volunteer to come up here so we can do it again. Did you do it before? Yeah. I, was come on, I, was I know. I see you. I watch the social media. What's your name? Parker. Parker. One power clap for Parker. All right. Let's do it all together. One power clap for Parker. Parker, go stand in the middle of the room. I don't know what Professor Young was doing. The bat was this way. The bat was this way. I don't, I don't really know. We're going to do it right right now. We love you, Professor Young. We're going to do it right. And again, repetition is the mother of all what? Learning. All right? So I want you to put your feet flat on the ground. Face that screen. Okay? You cannot move your feet. All I want you to do with two fingers, which is your lead hand. Good. Two fingers, you're going to focus on the top of the bat. I just want you to control it for 10 seconds. Before you start doing that, let's get some music. All right, hang on right there. The top of this bat are things that you can control. Now what you're going to do is the same exact thing, and all you're going to do is look at this little small barrel. If it falls, it falls. Don't catch it with the other hand. But before you do that, Okay, how much harder was it when you try to do a task, don't go anywhere, when you try to do a task and you're worried about and focusing on things you can't control, you just saw it. 10 more seconds, top of the bat, let's get this thing right. Here we go. Control what you can control. You just saw it. That's what life's about. The other thing Jason does, I don't know if you mentioned it tonight, but he wrote down all of his goals. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Steve Harvey, comedian, game show host. Steve Harvey, 36 years ago, was homeless, living in his car with $36. And if you listen to Steve Harvey talk, he says every time he wrote a goal down, he accomplished it. The power in seeing every day on a paper, in your journal, on a mirror, on the rear view mirror of your car, anywhere you want to get creative, write down what's important to you and what you want to do in your life. There is power in seeing that. Jason says, the bigger the goal, the bigger the effort. I couldn't agree more. And he said, have a detailed plan. It's one thing to write a goal down, but if you don't have a process to reverse engineer to get you from A to Z, you're never going to get there. You can say all day long you want to be an Ironman. But if you don't put this work in every single day, consistency is key. Consistency is what? Key. key. That, is the, that is the goal. The goal is not the, the result. There's a process over the outcome. The outcome is a byproduct. Jason getting to the finish line was not his goal. His goal was, what is he doing today? What is he doing tomorrow to prepare him a year out for an Ironman World Champion? And lastly, he says, never quit. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a movie, Lone Survivor. I had a chance to, to sit down with decorated Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell. And Marcus Luttrell looked me in the eye and he said, Todd, if you quit once, you quit again, you'll you always be a quitter. Don't ever quit. When you start something, you finish it. Period. Now, all of these things that Jason just spoke about are great things for us to take forward with us. But when I listen to Jason speak and when I when I um, put my remote somewhere, my clicker somewhere, 
when I when I watched this video, which you guys didn't see all of it, do you know what I took away from it? The adversities. Altered his life from a back bike accident at age 17. Paralyzed from the chest. He was on top of the world as a New England motocross athlete. A lot of you guys are around that age. Teenagers, low 20s. In his new world, he gets into a hand cycle and he goes out and does five miles. And the winner of the race comes back and greets him at mile two just to bring him home. You know how frustrating it is for a guy that was on top of the world? Then he doesn't finish his first track one race. Fails to qualify for four straight years. It took him seven years to finally get back on top. I had sales reps that go call on a doctor. The doctor says, nope, not using your product. They never go back. Seven years. He didn't fail. He lives and he learns. He wins or he learns. If there's nothing else you take from tonight, that you'll never lose. You win or you learn. So, if you want to see a magic trick, raise your hand. This is the only time I get nervous when I speak. I'm going to summarize Jason. I'm going to summarize Jason in the two errands with a magic trick. Okay? Every day that you guys wake up, you got a blank slate. This is just like this book. Every day you guys wake up, you got a blank slate. But when your feet hit the floor and you get out of bed, what happens every single day? I don't care who you are. Adversity hits. And it can come in any way, shape, or form. A boulder. A bungee. A bike. And in my illustration, that adversity shows up in black and white photos. Okay? That adversity in this book shows up in black and white photos. And at this point, you got two options. The first option is you can do nothing, just like in this book, because there's nothing in there, right? These are just blank pages I've already showed you guys. Or you can do what Jason's mother said, where she looked over her son's bedside after two days and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to give ourselves two weeks to feel sorry for ourselves. And then we're going to get up and get on and do the best we can with what we have. This guy's got over 40 marathons, 20 half marathons, Ironman World Championships, you name it. So what Jason did was he took the adversity, which were the black and white photos in this book. He became his own Picasso and he colored him in. He became his own Picasso and he colored him in. Give me one loud power clap. If I just Come on. Now. Come on. Nice. Come on. Nice. Excuse me, I'm sweating. Jason, in the two errands, understand it's not what happens to you. It's how you handle it. It's not what happens to you in life. It's how you what? Handle it. How you what? Handle it. Let's talk about how you handle it. Now, I'm going to do two minutes of this. Just to give you an idea, I always think it's important to understand who's speaking to you so you have a little bit of background. Okay? And I want to talk about how the three pillars of elite results came to fruition. I grew up a coach's son. My dad was a high school basketball coach in upstate New York for about 30 years. I got a chance to play for him for four years on a varsity team. I went on and earned a Division I scholarship at the University of Albany. It was a cool transition period. My first year, we were Division II, and then we transitioned into Division I, the American East Conference, so I got to play both levels. And then in 2000, between 2000 and 2007, I went on to play professionally in Europe, nine different countries. Really cool experience. And then from 2007 to last year, I started as a pharmaceutical sales rep, and I worked my way up the corporate ladder. I, I went into medical device in 2012, and then last year, I ended my corporate career as a vice president of sales for a company called Siemens Medical. I managed about $400 million. Really enjoyed it. Had a great, great time in, in med device and pharmaceutical sales. Loved it. And I've always been a guy that gravitated towards really successful people. Like, I wondered, like, why are these people so, so good at their craft? And in a sports world where I was playing basketball, where I had about 15 years as a young adult playing basketball, high school, college, professionally, it was about 15-year window. I studied people in the sports world. You know the names. Jordan Brady, um, Jordan Brady, Ali, Lindsey Vaughn, um, Kobe, Magic, whatever, right? The list goes on and on. 
And then when I got into the corporate world, I did the same thing. I started to beat on a new craft. And I started studying people like Gates, Jobs, Zuckerberg, Musk, right? The list goes on and on. And by the way, you don't need to be famous to be successful. I'm looking at a bunch of successful people right now that are going to find more success. But one of the themes in my life is whenever I was able to interact with someone that I could talk to, that I felt could bring value to me, and you know who they are. When people walk into the room, they've got confidence, they look the part, they act the part, they talk the part, they dress the part, you know them. I always was gravitated towards them. I want to know what's making you different. Why are you so good? And these people that I reached out to, I became obsessed with these people. Obsessed. And I would walk up to them like I was in third grade. I'd walk up and I'd shake hands and say, hey, can I be your friend? Because I want to know what you do to get to that level. And my wife thinks I'm crazy to this day. Whenever I hear something at a party or I'm at a restaurant and someone says something or walks in with confidence or I just see something I think can bring value to me that I can bring to other people, I go up to them I start peppering them. I'm like, hey, what, do you, what time do you wake up? When do you go to bed? What do you eat? How do you do vacation? Who are your friends? Like, I want to know. What are your routines and habits of excellence so that I can bring value to myself and serve other people? Here's what's crazy. After 30 years of research, three decades, they all had three things in common. They had a different level of mindset. They had exceptional leadership skills. And they understood how to build this culture or environment around them to give them the best chance to win. The best chance for success. And so when I figured that out, as you can see the three words up there, I thought to myself, well, it's one thing to know what they got, but how'd they get there? <clears throat> like, how did they, what are the skills? What are the drills? And as I kept doing the research, I realized that there were 24 skills that they mastered. And what I mean by mastered is they did the drills to build the skills to obtain the skill set, just like in athletics. <clears throat> Here are the 24 skills. Now, it's a little bit of a busy slide. But if you look at mindset, I always start with physiology because you've got to get your mind and body right first and you work your way around. You can see the eight skills on, on your mindset. If you look closely under leadership, you'll see the eight C's of leadership. And then under culture, if you start with mission, you'll see MVP, you come back to the one word brand, you'll see MVP trust process. Now, we don't have time to go through all 24 skills in the short time we have today, but what I'm going to do is give you a few that I think will help you guys so that when you walk out this door, we're going to level you up both person and profession. Okay? Okay. We're going to start with mindset, but before we do, I want everyone to stand up because we're going to play the mirror game. Here's how it works. I want everyone to have a partner. I want everyone to get a partner. Um, there's three people here, so just get next to someone. This is going to be really quick, really easy and fun. This is the way we keep the energy in the room. I want you to stand back to back with your partner. Back to back. Okay? And here's what you're going to do. Let's say I'm standing back to back with my partner. Okay? There are three moves you can make. The first move is this. Watch me. Everyone, all eyes on me. The first move you can make is you put your hands on your hips. You go, boom. On a count of three, I'm going to do that. One, two, three. Let's do that again. One, two, three. Good. The next thing is this. You can also go like this. Ska. One, two, three. Uh, you know, the energy's in choice. The next one is this. Do you have, anyone know Ralph Macchio? Who's Ralph Macchio? Right. Try it again. We can go like this. Why? Do that. One, two, three. Why? And here's what you got to do. You need to anticipate what your partner's going to do. So if I have a partner, I think they're going to go, boom. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. Boom. Now, if you get it, high five them. We're going to try it one more time. If you don't, you're going to sit down, fist pump them, and have a seat. You guys ready? Sorry, <laughs> all right, you guys ready? On the count of three, we're all going to do it together. Anticipate what your partner's going to do and jump and turn around and see if you get it the same. One, two, three. Boom. <laughs> ready? Everyone got it right. On the count of three, let's see who's connected. One. Oh, second one's like this. Oh, second one's ska, boom, or karate kid. One. Back to back. One, two, three. Scott. Scott. I was thinking of him. Yeah. Like, no way he's going to one leg. Good you'll notice. You'll notice. And, you, and this is important in life and in sales. I'm going to keep repeating myself. Life is not a ta talent game. There are a lot of people in sports and business 
that are a lot talented, a lot more talented than people that are in the NBA, in the NFL, or CEOs that we don't ever hear about because life's not a talent game. Life is about passion, enthusiasm, laced with strategy. And the more strategies you have with enthusiasm, you will rise to the top, period. Let's talk about mindset. I'm going to give you three strategies. The three strategies are right here. The skills are right here, right? Remember, there's a total of eight. I'm going to give you three. Of all the successful people I studied over the last three decades, every single person that I studied follows what's called the four fundamentals of optimal living, E-M-M-S. That stands for eat, move, mindset, sleep. Eat, move, mindset, sleep. Now, I get into a lot of these keynote talks with uh, companies, organizations. I show them my slide deck and the CEO will call me and go, Tom, why are you talking to my team about eating? This is a sales organization. You don't need to talk about eating. So I said, just give me the autonomy to do so. Fine. And then I get into a room of a thousand people. I say, raise your hand. And you guys can play along right now. Raise your hand if you ever had a big lunch. And then at 2 o'clock, you got your class, 2.30. And you feel like shit. You got a 2 o'clock ball. You're tired. You don't feel like going through the rest of your day. Raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you're lying. We've all been there, <clears throat> right? For me, right? I think for Zed, if you go home at five o'clock after a long day of sales and you're on fumes, but you got to be on point for your wife, for your husband, for your kids, and this the people you should be giving the most energy to, but you give the least because you just spent a day struggling through, through your day with energy, right? They should have the most energy from you. And I asked the organization to raise your hand. A lot of parents in the room, everyone raises their hand. I said, that's why we're talking about eating. Because under eat, every high performer doesn't have time for three meals a day. They don't have time to sit down and eat three big meals a day. So what they do is call something as they call eating on the ops. Eating on the ops. From 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., they eat every two hours. 7, 9, 11, 1, 3, 5, 7. They're not just eating anything. What they're doing is they're reverse engineering the calories they want to take in based on their goals. Gain weight, gain muscle, lose weight, maintain weight, whatever it is. Then they take their macros, fats, proteins, and carbs, and they reverse engineer and put them in every meal. So every single meal, guess what happens? You're never really hungry. You're eating every two hours, right? And you're never really full because you're eating in moderation and you're feeling good versus eating that bowl of pasta with cheese and Parmesan. Raise your hand. Where's the Italians? Right? Then you're like this. Then you're searching for Red Bull, Bang Energy Drink, and every coffee you can find. Eating on the odds. Now, again, you guys can walk out here and say, I like this. I didn't like that. That's what it should be about. I'm not telling you to, to love everything I say. I'm telling you, the successful people that I studied are doing these things. Eating on the odds. The second thing is called move. Raise your hand. If you've ever set the alarm clock the night before and you said to yourself, I know what I'm going to do. I'm motivated right now. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get my workout in first thing in the morning, do a cup of coffee, get the workout in, have a banana before class, whatever. How many people have done that? But they open up their phone and scroll up to Instagram. Wait, what's Katie up to? Ryan's dating her. Right? And then three, three more minutes go by, then 10 minutes go by. Then all of a sudden you check an email. Then all of a sudden you get in a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Then all of a sudden your workout gets derailed. Ever happened? Raise your hand. 100%. Right? So here's what I challenge you to do. Something called sweat before screens. Sweat before what? Screens. screens. iPhone or cell phone, laptop, TV, whatever it is. Before you open that up in the morning, get your mind and body right first. Just get up and go do something. You don't have to do an Iron Man. Just do something for 15 minutes a day. How many minutes? 15. We're going to come back to that number in a minute. 15 minutes a day. Just get your heart rate going. Because I'm going to tell you what happens. When you get your heart rate going in the morning, you get your mind right, and you do you, all of a sudden when you get hit with adversity, you're able to handle it much better. How many people have gotten done with work and said, I wish I didn't do that? No go. Eat, move. Let's talk about mindset. There's three things I do every single morning. Three things. Okay? I journal, listen to optimize, and success hotline. Let me just briefly talk about it. How many people journal? Raise your hand. A couple people. 
I got to tell you, that's really good. I was like, I, I had trouble writing down my feelings on a piece of paper. I just couldn't do it until I heard a type of journaling. I heard a type of journaling called Well, Better, How. Raise your hand if you know of the late, great Kobe Bryant. I watched the video once by Kobe Bryant. And he journals by doing something that I just mentioned, Well, Better. And what that means is every single day, and sometimes I do it tonight, like tonight, and sometimes I do it in the morning. I think to myself, what did I do really well today? I give myself gratitude. We don't do that enough. What did I do well? I was present with my kids. I wasn't holding my kid in one hand, texting someone in the other. Right? I gave, I gave the best keynote I could possibly give today. I was present when I was talking to people. I didn't put my cell phone on a table during lunch. It was a way. What did I do well? What can I do better is the next one. What can I do better? And then you think about those development areas because we're all trying to close the gap from where we are to where we want to be. And the last one is, how do we do it better? And Kobe Bryant did this his entire career as well. Well, better how. Great way to journal. Okay? Well, better how. And the last thing that I do is called Success Hotline. If you want to write this down, the Success Hotline. In January of 1992, anyone born in this classroom besides Zad and Jason? No. Dr. Rob Gilbert from Montclair State University in New Jersey created his first Success Hotline recording. It was three minutes. So when you call this number, there's actually a cell phone to this day, but now it's on a podcast. He would give you three minutes of motivation, a cool story, right? Some sort of inspiration, a lesson. 30 years, it's going to be 31 years this January. He has never missed a day. You want to talk about consistency and having the right mindset. I encourage you guys to wake up in the morning and get used to calling success on it. It's a great way to get your mind right. Eat, move, mindset, sleep. Okay. The second thing is AM and PM routines because that comes under sleep. Now, when I show this slide, I usually get two reactions. I never make this about me. It's not about Todd Center. It's about you guys. But I don't want to show clients that I work with their AM PM routines. So I'll show my own. Now, when I show this slide, the one reaction is Todd, that's really good. I need a lot of that strategy in my life and that structure. I'm going to use some of that. The other one I get is, you're crazy, and I'm never doing any of that. I don't care what side of the stick you're on. It's okay to be on either one. Let's just talk about it, okay? Take a look at this slide. So the first thing I do, you're going to notice, is on the left-hand side, it takes me 30 minutes to get ready for my PM routine. And the reason why I do that, uh, I have it on the left, is because your PM routines dictate your morning. And if you win the morning, you win the what? Day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So 30 minutes, what happens is this. At 9 o'clock every day, my, every night, my alarm clock goes off. And the reason why is sometimes we get we lose track of time and what we're doing. For me, I've got two young kids. We've got a lot going on. So what I do is I have an alarm clock set. At that point, it tells me to go through my checklist of 10 things. The first thing that I do is I set the room temperature between 66 and 68 degrees. There is a lot of data that suggests if you have it at that temperature, it lowers inflammation, it gets you into REM sleep, which is where we need to be for recovery, and it gets you into the right latency. Latency means you should be falling asleep when your head hits the pillow between 12 and 15 minutes. Anything less, you're exhausted, you need to work on that. Anything more, the television's on, you're on your cell phone, you're just going to wake up with heart. Okay, that's the first thing I do. Second thing I do is I set my one, I look at my 168 sheet. Anyone know what 168 means? There's 168 hours in a week. If you're not tracking where your time is going, 
I'm going to tell you right now, we did one of those exercises. It's going places you don't want it. So anyone in here who's got lofty goals in life, let's talk about a 168 offline. I set my clothes out for tomorrow in the closet. Work clothes, workout clothes. I take my cell phone, I plug it in, I put them on a workout clothes. I charge all my devices. If I wake up in the morning, I want to go for a jog, and I go to put my earbud ear earbuds in, and they're dead. That's just lazy. Let's get ready for class. Let's get ready for what we need to do the next day, and make sure we're on top of it electronically. Then what I do is I set the coffee pot to four fifty-five in the morning. I'm going to tell you why in a second. And then I got some hygiene routines at night. 9.30, second alarm goes off, lights off. And the reason why I chose 9.30 is because I want to wake up at 5 a.m. You guys have probably seen and read a lot of books. There's actually a book called Make Your Bed by General William McRaven of the Navy SEALs. And his, and his, his idea in the book is if you make your bed, you'll change your life and change the world. Because he says, nobody wants to make your bed. So if you do something you don't want to do and get out of your comfort zone, you create momentum, which will create momentum for more tasks during the day. So the first thing I do is I make my bed. If my wife doesn't get up at 5 a.m., I make it with her in it, over the top of her problem. <clears throat> right? Then what I do is I jump into an ice tank. You guys want to wake up? Get into 36 degree water. You'll be like, So I have that in my garage. Jump in. Then what I do is called contrast. Athletes, you probably know what this is. You go from cold to hot or hot to cold. So what I do is I either get an Epsom salt bath, depending on what my workout is that day, or a sauna. And while I'm in there, I'll get back to eat, move mindset. Success hotline, drink my coffee, do some well, better how, right? And by the way, I skipped optimize. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then I'll do optimize. All while I'm just sitting in a tub or sitting in a sauna. And then similar to Jason, this is my first year on the Ironman Triathlon Circuit. I just completed my first half a month ago. So super proud of that. And so my workouts are probably a little bit longer than most people, but again, it doesn't need to be an hour and a half. I come back after a workout, I'll contrast again. This time I've done a workout, I'm, I'm sweating, I'm hot, get in the ice tank, lower inflammation, take a shower, hot, boom, breakfast, 8 a.m. I've just done more in 11 hours than most people do in their week. Now, this isn't not about me and someone else because the only competition that you people have right now is you against you. The competition is, are you better today than you were yesterday? And can you be better tomorrow than you are today? Period. That's what life's about. So that is the AM and PM routines. Real quick thing on Optimize, if you want to be, if you guys are readers, leaders are readers, you don't have time to read a book, highly suggest you write down the word Optimize. The other name is called Heroic. And what it is, is there's a friend of ours named Brian Johnson. And what Brian Johnson did was he wanted to read more books, but he didn't have time. So he took this app and he put all the greatest books in history, good to great, tons of sales books, things that you guys would love, inspirational. And he put them into 12 to 15, 18 minutes. And when you can listen to it, read it, or watch a video, he takes all the big ideas out of the book and you see it in 15 minutes or listen to it. Really cool. If you're working out, taking a walk, whatever, driving, optimize is a great way to keep, keep your mind on. Okay. AM and PM routines. How many people on the side of you're crazy? You can say, you can do it, sorry. I'm crazy. Yeah. And how many people took something away that you might use? Some? Cool. Last one, I just handed out wristbands. Everyone get one? I wasn't sure if I had enough. Okay, on one side it says 1% and the other side it says, remember tomorrow, let's talk about 1%. We're gonna get back to 15 right now. 1% of 24 hours is 14 minutes and 24 seconds. So let's round up for the sake of the conversation, 15. All I challenge you to do is do something that really challenges you for 15 minutes a day. I've got people that want to get their master's. And I talk to, hey, did you get your master's? No, a year goes by. Hey, did you get your master's? No. Hey, you working on your master's? No, five years go by. The problem is, and write this down, it's the start that stops most people. You guys have probably been there. You want to do something. You're all inspired one moment. You're feeling good. You're motivated. And then you realize the work it's going to take. And then you're just like, I, don't, I can't do it right now. Now is not the right time. But if you just take 15 minutes, back to the master's example. I took that client in. I said, hey, forget about getting your master's. Tomorrow for 15 minutes, focus on what you want to study. Until you figure that out, don't move on. 
15 minutes a day. Once you get that, focus on the schools that have it. Look at where you want to go, location, proximity. Once you have that, apply 15 minutes. Once you start doing that, hence process over outcome, you'll get to the end result. So I challenge you, whenever you got something hard to do, the worst thing you need to study, don't put it off to the end, do it first, right? Recovery and athletics, get to get there early, get to the gym, get to the weight room early, do the things you don't want to do. The more you callous your mindset, anyone here with David Goggins? The more you callous your mindset and do things you don't want to do, the more comfortable you get. Let's get 1% better every single day with 1% of our day. We're going to get 1% better right now before we jump into this. I want everyone to stand up, and here's what we're going to do. All right? Everyone stand up. So you got three options. This side of the room is one. One team. This side of the room is the other team. You're facing each other. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to say one. You guys are going to say it. One. You guys are going to say two. You're going to say three. You're going to say one. Then two, three, then one. You guys understand what we're doing? Say yes. Here we go. On the count of three, you guys are going to start. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Good job. Stop. Now here's what we're going to do. Instead of saying one, you're going to snap. You're going to say two. You're going to say three. You're going to snap. We're going to go again. You guys ready? One, two, three. Two, three. Three. Two. Good job. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to start again. You're going to snap. You're going to clap. You're going to say three. You guys ready? Here we go. One, two, three. 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 Lose that last time. We're going to get this one, the best one. You're going to start by snapping. Pay attention. Be where your feet are. Snap, clap, stomp. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. High five the person next to you and have a seat. Not bad. You're ready, so I like that. You're focused. Let's quickly talk about leadership. Quickly talk about leadership. I told you I was working for a company called Siemens Medical. We had a four foot nine. Anyone four foot nine in here? We had a four foot nine woman. We had a four foot nine lady come into the organization as our new CEO. Her name was Jennifer. And she walked up on the stage at a national sales meeting in front of 5,000 people in Atlanta. And you could drop it. And she looked, it felt like she looked at all of us in the eye personally. She said, we are going to incorporate a cultural leadership approach called say what you see, trust the intent. And what she meant by this is having healthy confrontations is good. But there is a way to have a healthy confrontation by your delivery, by your tone, by your words. And so what she did is she gave us an example. So she said, what is your name? Ellie. Ellie, let's give Ellie one loud power clap. So Ellie, I'm going to give you two examples. The first example is I am your manager and you work for Novartis. Okay? And I say to you, hey, Ellie, listen, we got to talk. You came in, you came in with Jason, you know, a couple other people in this room came into the organization three years ago. And I don't know what it is about you, but you are so far behind the curve. curve. You're not delivering on sales. You've been underperforming, and it's been a struggle to manage your coaching. So you've got two options. One is you got to figure out next month. I'm going to put you on a PIP, a performance improvement plan. And if you don't get better, then at the end of 30 days, we're going to have to let you go, and I'm going to have to replace you. So it is, is what it is. It's not personal, but you're not where we need to be, and I can't have you continue to ship the bed when everyone else is doing that. Okay, sorry. That's one delivery. There's so many, so many managers agreed. That speaks to reps like that. The other way to do it is this. Hey, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate you meeting me here. And this conversation is really important to me. I actually recited it last night to my wife because I was a little nervous having it because I really like it. I brought you in a couple of years ago and I believe you have the potential to be really good. But in this conversation, I need to tell you the truth and I need to say what I see. I need you to trust my intent. And it's not going to be easy for you to hear. But what I'm going to tell you is this. I don't think it's any, uh, I don't think I'm pulling any wool over your eye to tell you that you're underperforming. But I know if I throw the right resources, 
and I have the right mentor, and I give you everything I can as a coach, that this time next year, when President's Club rolls around, I have no doubt that you will be on stage if you have two feet on the ground and you are all in and you're willing to do what he set forward for you. I need you to tell me that you are all in. Are you all in? Mm -hmm. Okay. So trust my intent that I have your back. And if we put the work in this year, I promise you we will be in a better spot. But it's going to be up to you. We good? Mm -hmm. You see the difference? What are the couple of things I did differently? I think in the second one, you used empathy. Yeah, yeah. How you felt like you were on her level instead of huge, him. huge. She was sitting. I don't want to act like I'm better. I don't want to act like I want to get on her level as much as I can. So that's huge, right? What else? You were her partner in improvement. Ask her what resources she gave. Correct. And I asked her <laughs> questions. I'm empowering her to tell me. Yes, I'm in. She might have said. I would be in if I get this, I get this, I get this. This is a very short example, but you guys get it. Anything else? Mm -hmm. It's nice like that you gave her like a choice. Like, is this what you want to? Always ask, right? She might say, I really don't think this is the right role for me. Okay, different conversation. You share the responsibility with her? 100%. I'll do my part if you do your part. So here's the way I challenge you. If you have brothers, sisters, obviously your parents, cousins, uncles, peers, I'm not saying to go around and say, Hey, let me say what I see. You got to trust my intent, right? If I walk home every single day and I got to fight my wife, I'm like, hey, Chrissy, let me say what I see and trust my intent. She'll kill me and probably for me. <laughs> Don't say it the same way. But you understand, you understand the concept of having empathy, getting on their level, listening, and just saying, hey, this isn't going to be an easy conversation. But we got to have it. If you can do it this way, you just watch the walls come down. But if you do it with your emotions on your sleeve, and you're in the heat of the moment, it's not going to work. This leads me to the other side of the wristband. What does it say? Remember, Remember tomorrow. tomorrow. It was January of 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> we were doing a, a simulated Ironman. That was when I first signed up for it. And I went out to San Diego with a friend of mine named Sean. Had it. You know Sean? You know Sean? Uh, he's a former Navy SEAL sniper. If anyone's ever seen um, American sniper Chris Kyle, Sean and Chris were in Afghanistan uh, in 2004 and five in Romani. So Sean and I were out on the beach and we're simulating an Ironman. Okay, so a half Ironman, I should say. So we did the swim, right? 1.2 mile swim. We did the 56 mile bike and we started to run. So we're on the beach in San Diego and Sean and I are running together. And I look over and boom, Sean goes down hard. I look at Sean, I go, hey, dude, what's up, man? What, what's going on? And I looked at his calf, and he had the biggest cramp you can imagine. It popped out. Look like he had a second cramp. Okay. I said, oh, dude. I said, look at man, we're done. 41 years old at the time. We're just messing around out there trying to do an Ironman. And he looks up at me. He goes, this is great mental condition. This is great mental training. Let's go. Oh, shit. And that's why he's a seal. So we just keep going. He's running. He's Hobbling, right? He gets himself back on track. We're going another two miles. Boom, he goes down again. Now the cramp is back here. You know, when you get one of those, you're like, you got to get it out. <laughs> right? And he's, he's like this. And he and I go, we're done, dude. We're, we're done, right? There's no aid station. There's not a live thing. I'm just, I need to get this guy electrolytes and gain, right? I'm like, let's go, man. He looks up and he goes, you don't get it, dude. I go, good one. He goes, help me out. So I'm helping out. He goes, I want to teach you something right now. Two words. Remember the mark. What are you talking about? He's walking down like this, and then he's like this. And he goes, Whenever you have to make a big decision in the moment, I want you to think about remembering tomorrow every time. And what I mean by that is this if I make a decision right now to quit because I got a cramp, this time tomorrow we're sitting on my couch having a beer, watching football. And everyone I talked to, I told them I was doing this simulated Ironman. And they start texting me, hey, Sean, how'd you do, man? What was your time in the swim and the run? How'd you do on the bike? And I got to text them back and go, I quit. I can't. How am I going to feel to deliver that text message? He said, so whenever you're in the moment, you're arguing with someone, you don't feel like studying, you don't feel like going to practice, 
Remember how you're going to feel 24 hours from now, how it's going to impact you and anyone that's involved in this bad decision. So I made these wristbands to, to entice my clients and challenge my clients and myself to get 1% better every single day and to always remember never to make a decision with emotion. That's what I use these for. And I, I hope this helps you guys. Raise your hand if you're a Tom Brady fan. Or in Boston. I mean, he left. I don't know. He might hear it now. Before I get to Tom Brady in, in the early 1800s, we had two prime ministers, Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone. And there was a lady that was having dinner with them on successive nights. And when she got done with both dinners, she got asked the question, hey, how did it go with both prime ministers? Like, what was your takeaway? She goes, man, when I was with Benjamin Disraeli, that guy is the most interesting guy, the smartest guy, the most intellectual guy I've ever met. She said, when I, when I met dinner with Mr. Gladstone, he made me feel like I was the most interesting, smartest woman in the world. That's charisma. Charisma doesn't say, here I am, when you walk into the room or a party. Charisma says, there you are, man. Hey, can't wait to catch up tonight, man. I was looking forward to having you come. That's charisma. Back to Tom Brady, I got a story that hits home. I think Professor Young has heard this before. But my brother-in-law, who lives in Needham, was tasked with doing Tom Brady's porch when he was moving to Brookline with Giselle. This is years ago, obviously, he played with the Patriots. And so the foreman comes over to my brother-in-law Rob's house the day before and says, hey, man, I want to tell you something about Tom Brady. You're going to meet him tomorrow. He's going to be on site asking a few questions. He's a hugger. I was like, what? Because you'll see. The next day, Tom Brady comes up on site. Black ass they rose up. Rob's already there with the foreman. They're waiting for him to come out. The foreman says as Tom Brady approaches, hey, Tom, man, thanks for coming. You got to meet Rob. He's going to do your porch. And Rob says, Tom, man, it's a pleasure to meet you. And Tom goes, Rob, come here. He gives him a hug. And then Rob stays, or, uh, Tom Brady stays for 90 minutes. Rob's telling him about the porch. He said, hey, man, we put these two chairs right here. We got the porch here. We're going to get two people that's going to be able to catch the sunset in the morning, which is going to be really cool. And you got some people in the shade that are catching the mountain view here, the trees, where they had over there in Brookline. They tore down some school. That, that wasn't cool, but it's all right. And so he's looking this way. He says, when the sun goes down, you got some people that's going to catch the shade. You know, you're going to see a cool sunset. We'll open a bunch of chairs here. If we turn it this way, we'll put four speakers here and blah, blah, blah. And Tom Brady's asking all these questions, man. How'd you think about turning the porch that way? What made you think of a sunrise and sunset? 90 minutes peppering him with questions. Time's over. Tom's like, hey, man, I got to run, Rob. Thanks so much for giving me a chance to, to learn from you. And, and Rob's like, Tom, thank you. Man. And Tom's like, dude, don't you already know? Come on. He gives him a hug. And the way Rob tells the story is he says, I now know why Tom Brady wins locker rooms. Because of the charisma that he has with his players. Obviously, he left the Patriots. In year one, what did he do? Yeah. He won a Super Bowl to another team. I should have retired at that point, but it is what it is. But this is why Tom Brady still wins. He did it again last night. Tom Brady has charisma. Tom Brady connects with people. <clears throat> okay? And we're going to connect with each other as we wind down tonight. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of this game. Everybody, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play the Rock, Paper, Scissors Elite Championship game. This game should take us no more than a couple minutes. Let me explain. I'm going to explain it. Raise your hand if you're college basketball fans. March Madness. I love it. I'm a basketball guy. A couple people. Every year at March Madness, here's what I do. We turn March Madness on. And I invite everyone to come over to my house. And in the lower right-hand corner is the score. I put blue painter's tape over it. I lower the volume on to mute. And I say, hey, I want everyone to tell me which team is winning. And everyone's watching the game. And let's call it, you guys both know Duke, Kentucky, they're big name schools. You got Duke here on the bench. You got Kentucky here. And for a couple minutes, you got Duke's bench up. The fans are going crazy behind the bench. Everyone's high-fiving on the court. There's a lot of energy and enthusiasm. What team is winning? Duke is on a run. And Coach Cal Perry calls a timeout. He regroups UK. Kentucky comes back on the court. They get an and one, a three-point play, a couple buckets. Now, all of a sudden, Kentucky's bench is going crazy. Everyone's high-fiving, doing their little dances, and the crowd's going crazy, right? It's so easy to see which team is winning based on enthusiasm and energy. And basketball is a game of runs. Well, here's the rule when we play rock, paper, scissors. If you lose, 
All you have to do is give energy. That's it. Because I want everyone to do right now. Put your right hand out. And with your left hand, I want everyone to follow me. So we're going to go like this. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. You guys ready? One, two, three. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Good. Everyone knows how to play. Now, here's what we're going to do. What is your name? Chandler. Give Chandler one lot power. Liz. Give Liz one lot power. So Chandler plays Liz. Let's see you guys do it. Face each other. Can everyone see? Ready? One, two, three. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Good. So uh, scissors beats paper. Here's what happens. You win. You're now going to become, become the juice machine. You're just going to have energy. So as you turn around and play, what is your name? Kareem. You're going to now play Kareem, and you're going to be going. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, I need to go. Let's go. One, two, three, five, six, seven, shoot. You got me. Uh, now, hold on. Now, Kareem won. Now, you two are back in Kareem. Kareem's going to someone else. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start on this side. Just look for people to play. You guys are going to start over here. And look for people to play. When you get done with a winner on that side, and you get done with a winner on this side, we're going to come up here. And the winner, we're going to play for the winner. We're going to play for the rock, paper, scissors. The league championship belt that you guys get to take home and keep. The rock, paper, scissors, league championship. Okay? So this is the belt we're playing for. Okay? Does everyone know what we're doing? We're going to get one winner from here. Then you come up here. One winner from here. You can start with each other. Once someone wins, you go to someone else. And in the end, you got one winner that's got everyone back in them and one winner, everyone back in them. Are you ready? Say aye. 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 Come Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sal's scared. He's trembling. I know. 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 I one, two, three. Come on, Come <laughs> Everyone get behind Sal is a big team <laughs> Turn there, yeah, that's good. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> two, three. Got it. Here's <laughs> the team win. This is the team win. Let's go, two, one. <laughs> what up, Sal? Cheers to him. We're almost done here. I appreciate your attention being with your feet are good energy there. Now, let me ask you a question. How well do you guys know each other? Really well? Not well? Somewhat? Maybe I can lean on and bust you up. What? When you lose, what did I say the rule was? Energy. energy. Now, how well do you guys know in a room if I were to say, who's the person that brought the most energy once they've lost it?
couple of people pointing out what your name. My name's Gavin. Gavin. A couple of people pointing at Gavin. Anyone else? Anyone agree? Disagree? I agree. Also, Dom. Dom? Okay, Dom's loud. <laughs> Anyone else agree with Dom? Raise your hand if you agree with Dom. You, you do? <laughs> do that again. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Good. Eight. How many people agree that it's Gavin? So who won? <laughs> yeah. You guys know this song? Oh, take this, this good All right. You guys doing okay? We're almost done, right? You got a couple of minutes? Let's talk about that last pillar, this last pillar really quick, the culture. Raise your hand if you know what your brand is. What is your brand? You can shout it out. I said raise your hand, but if you know what it is, what's the definition of brand? Anybody? Brand. No wrong answer. What you're known for. What you're known for. Good one. Yeah. Who you are. Who you are. What else? What do you believe in? What you believe in. I've heard a lot of different definitions for brand. Here's my favorite one. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. And the reason why they're saying what they're saying about you is because you created them. Your presence, how you treat them, how you act, what you say, high energy, low energy, positive, negative, whatever you do on a day to day, that is in your core at the moment is your brand. You ever gone to a party and so and so person was here? No, they're here. You ever been to that? Ever seen it? That's their brand. Whatever they did, they did that to you. So here's my challenge. You want to find out what your brand is, where it sits today. Here's the here's the exercise. I want you later tonight or tomorrow to text the five closest people to you. And the reason why we do that is because we're going to tell you the truth. Don't, don't go text people that won't be honest. For me, it's my two parents, my two sit, my parents, my two sisters, and my brother-in-law and my wife. I did six. And they didn't know it 10 years ago. I said, hey, send me three words that describe me. That's what you're going to send for them. Just send me three words that describe me, good or bad, I can handle it. And whatever those th three words are from all five or six people, I want you to write them out. And I want you to see what are the words that I really like. I have empathy. I'm energetic. I'm always smiling. I'm smart. Whatever they tell you, you keep doing that. You keep being you. But if you see something like negative, moody, don't know what you know who I'm going to get, what set of the bed they rolled out on, whatever they tell you that you don't like, you go work on that. That is your developmental area. Better yet, if there is a person that you know celebrity, locally, someone in your family, friends, where you're like, man, I love how they are. I love being around them. You need to learn from them. If you emulate someone, go talk to them and go help, let them help you be more like them. That's your brand. The second thing is the four-step success formula. Every successful person that I study follows this. They set their attention, their goal. Then they schedule it. Put it on a calendar, plan it, just like Jason said, have a detailed plan, measure it. Is this good? Am I on the right track? Do I have to pivot? Do I have to tweak? And then R and R means rinse and repeat or reflect and refocus. Okay. I don't care what you do, I guarantee you've used this before. If you got to mow the lawn, guys, you ever mow the lawn? Right? For me, I'm a homeowner. I'm in my office, I look out, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna mow my lawn on Saturday. Boom, set my intention and schedule it. Then I mow my lawn. I pull out of the driveway. I'm like, man, I don't like the lines going this way. I don't want to go this way. Looks cleaner. I measured it. And then we rinse and repeat with more lawn next week, two weeks, whatever it is. I don't care what you do. You're doing this. The issue is you don't know you are doing it until you get intentional and get dialed in. So if you have a big goal or you have to overcome an obstacle, I challenge you to really follow this 
and you'll watch how accelerated you'll be in accomplishing what you set out to do. Okay. And the last thing is a masogi. Raise your hand if you've heard of a masogi. A masogi is an ancient Japanese ritual. And what they believe is this. You should do something every single year that is so difficult that it challenges your other 364 days in Ironman. For me, in February, I did my first marathon. And then this past October, I did my first half Ironman. That was my two Masogis for 2022. Next year, I have a very big Masogi to follow in Jason's footsteps and do a full triathlon, full Ironman, right? So it doesn't have to be fitness related. If you guys want to start a business, if you want to read one book a month, if you want to go ask out the person of your dreams and you're hesitant to do it, set your Masogi and go get it. Okay? Now, this is how I'm going to end. Does anyone know what this is? Very good. He said a line. That's not what What else? Any guesses? Never. What's that? <clears throat> Never ends. Never ends. Okay, anyone else? Go get your dreams. Go get your dreams. I like that. You know what this is? This is your life. Now, the energy has been so good for the past hour and 20 minutes. And I don't mean to end by bringing the energy down, but let's get, re let's get re realistic for a minute and let's talk about reality. Now, this might hit a little bit more home to me, Jason, and Professor Young, because we're almost twice your age. But you guys will understand the concept because everyone here is really intelligent. This is your life from the day you were born to the day you die. Now, there is a statistic out there, if you go Google this when you leave, that the average person lives to be 78 years old in the United States. Now, let's just for one second, I hope no one in this room is average. Well, let's just for one second, for the sake of the illustration, let's just say we are. We're all going at 78. For me, I'm 44 years old. Now, I just did Halloween for this, the third time with my three-year-old and the first time with my one-year-old. So if this is correct, I got 34 Halloweens on. That's it. To be a good father, good husband, good brother, good son. <clears throat> That's it. And here's what's crazy. Remember I told you this line is your life from the day you're born to the day you die? Well, guess what? That's my life now. Right there. So I know you're calculating your own age and you've got a longer line than the three of us. But here's what's important. Before you even blink, you guys are going to be in your corporate, corporate career and you're going to be our age. Trust me. It goes fast and life is short. So what I encourage all of you to do is to not count the days, but make the days count. And the way you make the days count, you may not know this, we just spent 90 minutes talking about it. Let's review it. Here's what you do. I talked about that. Yeah. So I know we have a couple minutes left. You guys got me all hyped up here. 
If you have questions, happy to answer a little bit of Q&A. I know some people if you want to leave. We got Jason here as well, so I'm happy to stay a couple minutes. You guys want to take off and take off. We uh, appreciate both of you coming in tonight. I, I mean, this is electric from uh, minute one. You got a couple of champions in the room here, um, which is obviously good. But I think the core lessons, um, hopefully, you guys can take not just from sales, but business in life. Right? A lot of what Todd talks about are applicable when you guys get out of here, which is so vitally important. Right. Um, I don't know if you guys have questions, Todd's here. We'll hang around for a little bit. Sure, you guys are more than welcome to come to Todd. Uh, next week, next week, you're going to have two different companies come into class. You'll have Apex Solutions and you'll have um, Alku. And they're going to do a couple scenarios with you guys next week. All right, so be prepared, group work, and there's a, a couple of other um, sales simulations that we're going to be doing. All right, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll email that all out. All right. Um, finalizing reading through all of the midterms. I know that I said I was going to get to it. Those will be done very shortly. All right. There's 31 people and I want to make sure that I read everything and we do it the right way. So I apologize for not getting it to you by tonight, but it will be done this week. So that way you guys have at least a few grades. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, first of all, Todd, Jason, thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. My name is Duncan. Um, both of you are extremely inspiring. Um, Todd, you mentioned that um, everybody has the same amount of energy. All you have to do is unblock it. How do you unblock it? Because I often struggle with that a lot. Um, you know, bringing the same energy to things maybe I'm not passionate about. Uh, yeah. How do I show that energy? Yeah, so it's a great question. And, you know, this was very high level tonight. And I, I talked about things that we kind of skate through. What I tell you is, number one, is whether you have to do something or want to do it, like I said, you're either all in or in the way. So first thing you need to do is help your help yourself understand that I'm going to do something, and I, let's do it to the best of my ability. Because again, the goal is to be better than you were yesterday and better tomorrow than you are today. That's what life's about. And you saw at the end that life is too short to aimlessly roll through it and just do things half-assed. Okay. Number two, I'll tell you is go back to control what you can control. So I think it's really important to understand that if you just focus on things you can control. You ever listen to Jocko Willink? Maybe you see him. So, oh, yeah, I have a little bit. Jocko Willick is a great guy to listen to. And he says, I never wake up and say, Am I motivated? Do I feel inspired today? Because if I just walk through life on how I feel, I'll never get to accomplish the goals I want. Okay. So his whole, his whole like um, karma piece is let me wake up and do something that's called function over feeling. Okay. Function, task. What do I need to do today? Feeling. It doesn't matter how I feel. What matters is, my 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 why i think i heard professor young talk about that and here's the here's the last part you. if you have a big enough reason why you'll find a way out if you have a big enough reason why you'll find a way out so a lot of my clients will come to me and know like you they're like i don't have the energy i know what i kind of want in life what i do is i'll spend the first 10 sessions 10 hours going through what's called the seven layers of why if you've never heard of that before is basically you just start asking yourself questions why do I wake up in the morning? What do I want to accomplish in my life? Who do I want to be? Why do I want to be that person? What do I want to get out of it? When I'm in, when I'm 78 years old in an adult home, what do I want to look back at my life and say I did? When you start thinking about that, you get up differently because you're changing your mindset and you're understanding that life is so short. And if you're just going to sit there and watch it go by, you got to put one foot in the door even if you got one foot out and just start taking action towards what you want, you have to find a one. Thank you. High level, but I'm happy to take it off now. Who else? Yeah, I'm going to have a question. So you mentioned about your routine and um, you were like, I go to bed at nine and I wake up at five and I think <clears throat> probably the majority of people want to do that. But you know, in college, life gets in the way a lot. Uh, and, you know, there's a bunch of parties going on on the weekends. You know, you have this event, this event, like so many things. So do you like sacrifice some of them? Do you find a way to balance it? Like, what do you do? Because you want to, you know, have friends in college, have fun, but you also want to have good grades and get a job. So. Yeah. I'm going to give you my own example to answer this. And this might not be for everybody. But you guys not know who I am. I paid for my dad, got a scholarship, went on to play professionally and achieved the goals I wanted to achieve. 
I used to walk into parties in high school very rarely. Um, and I would walk in and people would say, that's Coach Center's son, Pat's here. And they, they'd hide their beer, they'd do some crazy stuff. I'm like, oh, guys, you do what you want to do. I had my first sip of alcohol as a sophomore in college. Okay, so my why was bigger than a house party in high school. My why was bigger than going to bogeys or Peabody's in downtown Albany. It was bigger than that. My two years out of four years at Albany, they were the number one party school in the country and they beat out Florida State. It was crazy. But no one else on my team wanted to leave college as a senior and go overseas and get paid to play the game more. I did. So what I did was I swam upstream. I, I, I was the one that said, hey guys, I'll go out for an hour, but I'm coming back because I got to get ready for practice tomorrow. I'll go do this, but I'm going to come back in before that because I'm going to get up at five and get some shots up. That was just me. So the answer your question is, if you have big enough goals, if your goals are that lofty, then you're going to have to sacrifice what you're doing because I can tell you what. What year are you? Senior. Senior. Remember that freshman party back in March of 2019? No. Yeah. Well, you mean like before remember that, COVID? Remember, yeah, before COVID. Remember that one freshman party you went to? I think you went to a million. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. Which one? Um, the one with my friends room on the hall. Remember? Do you remember all of them? Definitely still lived there, yeah. <laughs> so my point is, she's killing me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you another example. What's your favorite TV show? Um, oh, I don't know. House, you know, Dr. House. House. How long has that been on? A lot of years, right? Oh, yeah, it's like 2000 something. Right. So, like, if I said, you remember that episode in 2014 on that Wednesday night? You're going to go, no, I don't know. My point is this you're never going to remember all the parties. You're never going to remember everything that you, you wanted to do to have fun. Well, people say that all the time. Like, when I was growing up, they say, Are you having fun? Like, you go to play basketball every day, you're a gym rat. All you do is play basketball, all you do is work out. That was my fun. So if your goal, if you find your passion in life, you're going to have fun doing it. And other people are going to see it as a sacrifice. I didn't see it that way. So, no, I wasn't getting hammered as a freshman or junior or senior in college. I went out. I had fun. I enjoyed my time. I went downtown. I played darts. Everyone's having fun. I made a lot of friends. But my goal was when we graduate, I'm going to Europe and getting paid to play the game I love. If you have a big enough reason why, you'll find a way out. So I sacrificed that in order to get to my ultimate goal. There are days, if you listen to Jason's video and I can send it out, Jason said, there are so many days that I just didn't want, to, didn't want to get out of bed. But if Jason didn't get out of bed 10 months ago, he would have never crossed the finish line at Kona a month and a half ago. That's what it takes if you want to be great. If you're cool with, with what I said earlier, if you're cool with being average, if you're cool with just you know living for the weekend, and getting ready to watch football and just doing what you want to do, that's great. That's, I'm not, there's no, nothing against that. That's just not me. I want to follow the people that I study and I want to be remembered for serving people, making impact, and running a company that I wanted to make. That I wanted to make. So there is sacrifice. But you got to have fun too. Any other questions? Good. Gotta go have fun. It's fun tonight. <laughs> Ready to go. Thank you guys. Thank you. What state are you from? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, all you guys. Yeah. Um, you put it on here or not? Uh, so I graduated this time. I was thinking about it. They were calling you and I said, no, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah, you so you throwing it? Yeah. 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 Thank you. What are you doing at the end of the study one? Yeah, that was one of the hardest things. What do you want to do after that? So I guess I can.
Thank you. 